today, but what I called it, the, the message is passing timeless truth into turbulent times. And it's been turbulent times for the last two and a half years for sure with um, COVID and, and all the different reactions and elections and all the, the things that have really seemed to have polarized our culture. And, and it's similar to when a storm blows through, only the things that are rooted and grounded make it through the storm. If it's trees and there's loose branches, the loose branches get broken off. And Jesus said, if you abide in me, I'm the vine. If you abide in the vine, then you get the fruit. So when things get rough around us, we stand on our firm foundation. Uh, my house is built on the rock, not on the sinking sand of this culture, right? And it's not always easy to think of that. That's one of the ways that we all could help each other so much is that we talk to each other about our lives and how God has used us and the testimonies that we have. I said it earlier while I was singing that song about Egypt and being bred out of Egypt, I was missing some of the words because I, I had such a clear picture of what he was delivering me out of. And it, I just got so grateful in that moment and it kind of just catches your breath away that he would take such a mess and turn it around, and whatever he would choose to use, I shouldn't even be alive. So any good that comes from my life is a blessing. But the more the better, amen? The more that we could be used as weapons in the hand of the Lord to destroy the works of the devil, the more God is pleased with our lives, right? The Son of Man was manifest that he might destroy the works of the enemy. So what's the challenge here? The older man is in the front, and then time is going away from the older man. And you would think it's three generations here. That's, that's how I interpreted it. And, and the gap between the man with the beard and the boy at, at the back gets bigger with every passing generation. And I'm going to touch on that today because I think that we all need to try to make a decision in our heart to be intentional, intentional about reaching out to younger people. Okay? We don't always think that they want to hear what we have to say, and they might not want to hear what we have to say. But what about you wanting to hear what they say? Thank you, Nate. He's like my foot pedal there. Ah, ah. <laughs> Special effects. And I'm going to talk about that, so I don't want to jump it. But, the, but my text verse is right there in Matthew 7, 14. It's the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, wide, I'll just read it, right? Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by that road of destruction. But narrow is the gate, and difficult the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, that's, that's a little sobering, isn't it? We want to be the few that find it every day, Right? When he said, lead us not into temptation, he wasn't saying that God was purposely leading us into temptation. He was saying, no, make us aware of where this wide road could lead me to destruction and keep me focused on your compass so that I can hit that narrow road in every situation, in every conversation that I have, in every interaction that I have. I pull in to get gas. It's not the gas attendant's fault that it's expensive, okay? Don't blame him. If, if your hamburger comes out cold, don't blame the waitress, all right? They're short-handed. They're having a hard time right now in the restaurants, right? Like, you could be in church for two hours and they go out to lunch with people and they get rude with the people who work there. Like, what happened to those two hours of worshiping? <laughs> so all these things is still a narrow road. And, you know, how, how many times have you been with people in a restaurant and they give a prophetic word to the waitress? or to the waiter, or to the guy who's bringing stuff to the table. They're not used to people treating them kindly, at least not always. Our son said, 80% of the people are really nice, but the other 20% are psychos. <laughs> so all I'm saying is, don't think it's just for the big stuff, because everything to God is big, and all relationships are really big to him, okay? So that's how I'm applying this today. And you know, Maybe a subtitle would be, Timeless Truth for Turbulent Times. Okay, we're in turbulent times. You have to believe that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is rock solid. That's never going to change. That is true. As much as people want to hammer that message and try to knock it down, they can't because it's true. We build our lives on that rock. And then I, you could pick hundreds of verses like this. I just gave you a few that relate to salvation. 
And because that's never going to change. After we're gone, people are still going to need to get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Does anybody here disagree with that? We recognize as Christians that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We can't save ourselves. But there's good news. Acts 2.21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true. You don't have to hand in your resume and wait for their people to call your people. Call on the name of the Lord. He will save you. The thief on the cross. Remember me. That's all he said. Lord, remember me, Lord. Never went to church. Never got baptized. Never read a Bible. Who knows? Maybe he did. I don't know. But he sure wasn't in a good situation. And he, he was like one of those lobsters when you go to the supermarket and they're in that fish tank. It's like, things ain't looking good for us, bro. I don't know if we're getting back to the ocean. <laughs> when you get nailed to that cross, man, there's not a lot of options. So this guy was calling out at just even at the last second. It's never too late. Don't wonder if your loved ones are in heaven or hell. You don't know if they cried out to the Lord before they pass. Selah. Acts 2.38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the redemption of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a good promise. I don't know where I'd be without the gift of the Holy Spirit. I would probably be like Jack Frost, if you ever heard his testimony. And he used the word of God to beat people up, to constantly bring condemnation. It was never enough because that was what he came out of until he got healed. And the letter without the spirit <sighs> kills people. But the spirit without the law kills people too, right? They just float off into outer space. So we need the grounding in the word. The Lord is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. But what a great promise. If I repent and, and get baptized and claim Jesus as my Lord and Savior, he fills me with his spirit. That's really good news. All of you that said this have his spirit in you. I believe personally we don't fully yield to the spirit in us in every dimension of our lives. And that's another thing we can work on on a regular basis. Where am I not yielded to you? Where am, I, where am I allowing my opinions to override the truth of the Word of God? Because you remember I taught a message that said all truth is inconvenient to somebody. I thought I could go 80 miles an hour on the parkway. Oops. Inconvenient. Points on my license. I thought I could talk to somebody on my phone while I was driving my car. No judgment zone. If you get the ticket, it's expensive. I'll leave it at that. Malachi 4 said in verses 5 and 6, the last verses of the Old Testament, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. He will what? Say it with me. Turn the hearts of the, to the children. I think the order there really matters, and it's not just fathers, it's parents, but it specifically says fathers. Right? The thing that has to change, the reason I mentioned that each of us should be more intentional about talking to young people, not to lecture them, but to talk to them and get their feedback, the reason is they can teach you something, <laughs> okay? They can teach you something. I grew up, my dad and I had a pretty good relationship, not phenomenal, but pretty good, all things considered, and I don't ever remember him telling me once that he learned anything from me. <laughs> but I have learned so much from my two sons. It's been amazing. We feed off of each other, and they call me because they want my advice and not money. <laughs> it's an awesome feeling. But it was because I had to open my heart to even think I could learn something from them. And maybe you don't suffer from that, but our culture does. And, you know, don't, don't make blanket generalizations. Oh, Gen X, they're this, they're that. They're shiftless. They're distracted. They're lazy. Stop cursing our young people. No. What have you done to invest in them? How many do you know? How many conversations have you had? Not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody. It's just a revelation that he gave me that I want to share. Because we, we are holding timeless truth because God is not in time, but we are in time. And that makes it difficult to keep translating it with fluency to the next generation. And they're not going to try to teach you their language. They're not going to try to get you to like their quote-unquote music. 
we became that older person that said, that's not music. Back in my day, that was really music. This has been going on forever. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and then when that happens, the hearts of the children will open up to their fathers, and they'll be willing to hear from us. But they want us to start on equal footing, not the sage on the stage pointing down, and I know all the answers. And when I was your age, careful. It's like Charlie Brown, remember? Wah, 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 wah. They, just shut, they shut their ear off. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. I mean, this was written a long time ago. And God is saying, the older people, it's an obligation. It's not a suggestion. We have to try to pass these timeless truths down to them in a way that they can receive it. Not based on what we thought. And that's a challenge. It's really a challenge today. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Now, what could that mean when you were a kid and you said, why, you told me to do something, why did you tell me to do that? And, and your parent goes, because I told you so. Let me just tell you, that's not an answer. <laughs> you might not always have the time to give them the full big answer, but it's a little disrespectful to just say, don't ask any questions, just do it because I said it. That's not a healthy relationship. And you might not be able to always explain it all, but... If you give them enough times when you do, then you just say, look, I'll explain it to you later. We just don't have the time right now, but I'll tell you. And you better hope you say, I don't know why, because it's just how we've always done it. <laughs> That's not a good sign either. <laughs> Nobody ever said that in church. <laughs> Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Start out by saying, I am your ally child, young person, whatever, if you're teaching in, in the children's ministry, they're learning very differently than we did. Anybody say amen to that? So listen, I just a couple of verses here to, to, to talk about this idea of we have increasing, God has increasing expectations of us the longer we're serving him, just like you would with your children. We're his children. And if you're eight, you have different expectations from the parents than if you're 18 or 28. Fair? Okay? I think I'm setting you up, don't you? So as we mature in the Lord, he doesn't want us still drinking milk. He wants us eating meat, and he wants us confronting difficult situations. And if we don't progress, it's on us. In the business world, they say, if you don't innovate, your business will die. So if you don't keep looking for new ways and better ways of doing things, someone else will. And if you're selling clothes in a retail store, Amazon just took all your business. Because people can get it faster. They don't have to drive to the mall, hassle with the parking. It's cheaper. And, and if for some reason you don't like it, they'll take it back. No problem. Well, man, you can't keep your head in the sand about these things. Same with the church. We better be intentional about reaching the young people in a way they can receive it. Not to water down the word. Here it is. But to present it in a way, fluently, that they can understand the truth in their vernacular, in their dialect. Zacharias, is that, you know, he's in the temple. You know this is John the Baptist's father, but before he had the baby, he's in the temple, and he says to Gabriel, the angel, how shall I know this is true, what you just told me? How shall I know that my wife is going to give birth? You all know what I'm talking about, right? I don't have to unpack it too much. For I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And Gabriel said, well, you know what? Because you didn't believe it, you're not going to speak between now and when he's born. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to be the mouthpiece of God. And because you didn't believe it, your mouth is going to be shut. Just to remind you that you've been praying for this. You've been praying. You're a priest. Not a newbie. You're a priest. And you're not believing? I came here on assignment. I'm writing you up. You got a ticket. <laughs> Points on your license. Your insurance premium is going up. Geico, help me, Geico. See, that's just rough. But it's really not. You wouldn't want it any other way. You wouldn't want somebody up here standing who's a novice. Because the church is full of vulnerable people. And he loves you enough to make sure these people are tested and tried. Not perfect. But pursuing God. Men and women after God's own heart. So... It, the, the, the response was not good by the angel. You're going to be cut off. But then in the same chapter, in verse 34, the same chapter, he comes to Mary and, said to the, and Mary then says to the angel, but how can this be since I don't know a man? 
doesn't this look like a very similar answer? So what's different? She's 14. I don't know. She's a teenager. She's not a priest. She didn't pray. God, make me pregnant miraculously. <laughs> so she's got a different set of facts here. And she's young and she's immature. So he, doesn't cu he cuts her slack because different situation. But we get real religious. And we think everything has to fit in this nice, neat little box. That's not a good way to live. I'll leave that at that one. I quoted this one earlier, Galatians 4. Timeless truth for turbulent times. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son into the world, born of a woman, subject to the law. So he was just like us. He could have sinned. Born of a woman, natural, of the law, subject to the same rules and regulations. Went through 33 years and never had one violation. Amazing. To free people who just like those who were subject to the law, ultimately he wanted us all to be, say it with me, okay? Adopted as sons and daughters. So as you look around, this is your family. If I could just say it that way, this is your family. He wanted us to be adopted as sons and daughters and mix it up with the people that we're in church with especially because this is a very special thing. When the body of Christ comes together, we need each other, okay? We need each other. We hold each other accountable. We want to be mentoring people, and we want to be mentored by people who are, 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 have more insight in whatever area that is. It's not just an age thing. It's a gifting thing. If people are operating in their gift, they can teach you a lot, and they can also impart to you. So I guess you're getting the point. We're adopted as sons and daughters. Because you're now part of God's family, he sent his spirit the spirit of his son into our hearts, and the spirit calls out, Abba, Father. We were singing about that this morning. We will always sing about that because whatever the world says is our identity is not perfectly aligned with what God says is our identity. We have to always keep asking, show me what you see about me. Show me what you see about my boss, about the people who work for me, who I'm having such a hard time. It's not easy to fire somebody when you're a Christian. <laughs> Some of them have had to do this. You could be doing them a favor by firing them because you're not enabling them to continue in a job that they're not qualified for. Selah. Verse 7 of Galatians 4 says, You no longer have to live as a slave. Hallelujah. Anybody who's been addicted knows what that's like. You no longer have to live as a slave, but we were all slaves to sin, so whether you were addicted or not isn't the issue. You're a slave to something, and Paul said, the, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. This is the, the condition of every human being. And he was saved. He was a leader in the church, and he was saying that. Right? So it's not like we fully arrive, but we have more tools in the toolbox, and we have each other to help each other and testify. And when you hear somebody else walk through a difficult situation, it builds your faith. And if you're getting prayer, make sure everybody around you believes that you can get healed. <laughs> but I, I just I backed. I, I went a little too fast. You no longer have to live as a slave because you're a child of God. And since you are his child, God guarantees an inheritance is waiting for you. Now, that sounds really good. Because it is. But it's hard to grasp it at the deepest level of our hearts. That we're really children of God and that we have an inheritance. Would anybody agree, based on your experience, that knowing the Father's love at the deepest level has not been an easy task? Hearing it and, and knowing that you could pray for somebody else, but you have less faith for yourself because you still know all the mistakes you made and nobody knows all the mistakes you made like you do. <laughs> nobody can condemn you bigger than you can but God say no you're forgiven as far as the east is from the west that's how far I've removed your transgressions from you so why are you cursing yourself with something I'm not even saying over you anymore tell that accuser to shut up I'm gonna listen to the Word of God about who I am and my identity in Christ and this says no longer to live as a slave because now I'm a child of God and as a child I have an inheritance that's waiting. I'm Mephibosheth and I get to sit at the table with the king. Not because I earned it, because he loves me. Not because you did anything to make him love you, just because he's a good God. You can't earn his love. 
but you can please him in the way you live your life. Amen? Our first-time visitor looks very interested right now. This is great. <laughs> I didn't even recognize you with the haircut. So good to see you. You look great. So this is one of my heroes, Yogi Berra, an Italian philosopher from the city of New York. He had a way with words. Right, Dan? Right? I mean, what he said made no sense, and it made sense, which is making it harder to make sense. Like, that shouldn't make sense, but it does. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. That's what Yogi said. This is a little better. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. That might not sound so profound to you right now. I'm going to try to make it more profound because we're really good in the church about talking about theory. Right? We learn a lot of theory, but we're short on how do I implement this in my specific situation, right? And that's part of what we're here for. That's why it's good to go grab a cup of coffee after service and hang out with people and get to talk to them and, and get to know them. And we have so many amazing, gifted people in this church. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So... We have to be intentional about that, though. But I have found if you go in with the idea that I have something to learn from you, then I'm just as happy to be there maybe as you are because nobody has a corner on all knowledge. Listen, it's only wisdom when you put it to use. It's just theory. It's plenty good to have the theory, but you have to also then put it into practice. I guess you can tell I get frustrated by this point. So here's a commentary. It says, if we really love the Lord, we will love his children. So look around next to you and tell somebody you love them because they're a child of God. I love you. <laughs> and if we really love his children, then we will point them away from destruction road. Remember, the wide road leads to destruction. And we will lead them onto the flourishing life parkway. All right, so that person that finds that narrow road more and more often is living a more flourishing life than they would have if they didn't. So it's, we're not comparing ourselves to each other because we all got dealt a different hand in life, and we don't want to do that. We don't compare to other people. But I can compare me to me yesterday. And is me today more like Jesus than me yesterday? That's a flourishing life. And it keeps getting more fully flourishing the more we do that. Like Paul, I like this. This is, we are born out of time. What does that mean? You remember when he said that, right? That, that the Lord had appeared to him, even though he wasn't one of the disciples that was traveling in the ministry, the Lord appeared to him. Remember, when did that happen? On the road to Damascus, right? And, and the Lord appears to him. And he says, like one born out of time. And I just want to put a positive spin on that for you. Because if God is not in time, but we are, part of our struggle is to get in God's time while we're in time. And that's why the drummer is the most important musician in the band. In my opinion. In my very humble opinion. Because when they're off, everybody's off. <laughs> And you can't shut them off in the booth because <laughs> everybody will still hear it. I'll leave that alone. But what they're trying to do is hear the rhythm of heaven and bring it into a time-bound earth. A timeless rhythm has to be brought into a time-bound earth. And when it happens well, we get in a portal and we feel the presence of God and people give testimony that they got healed. Nobody prayed for them. Nobody touched them. It wasn't even the one-step program. It was worship. How'd you get healed? I don't know. I left the house this morning. I couldn't see. Now I can see. You go figure out how it happened. I just know I can see. Hallelujah. So we're born out of time, which means that we can't allow the culture to overtake us in our decision making as hard as they're trying to do that. So we're born out of time in a good way because we're always going to be in God's time. And the better we are at translating that timeless truth into the next generations, the more likely they'll live a flourishing life. And that's what we all want for the people we love, flourishing life. It's going to mean something different for each one of us from a fact pattern. But flourishing to you means something different to me. But are you flourishing? And if you ask people if they feel like that, many will say no. If they even like their job, many will say no. So they just have to do it. They have to keep showing up, but there's not a lot of grace on them for it. And that's not a fun place to be. 
How about the sons of Issachar? They knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. How many want that anointing? Oh, yeah. Not just to know the theory, but to know the practice. This is the role of the apostle and the prophet. That's why it says in Corinthians that the foundation of the church is built on that foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Because the prophets are hearing the Lord, and the apostles are trying to execute on the plan that they're getting. And they have to work together. I'm pointing at my wife because that's how it's been for us. She's more the prophet. I'm more the apostolic person that builds. But i got to hear what she's saying. Hopefully she's hearing what I'm saying too because when it works well, that's when you get the best results. And if you want a flourishing church, keep praying that that happens. Pray for us and the leaders that that will happen. I'm going to go a little faster now. It says, the disciples came to Jesus, questioned him about the kingdom. Jesus called a little child and said, this is the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. In that kingdom, the most humble, who are the most like this child, are the greatest. They didn't want to hear this. This sounded like another one of those weird sayings, another riddle he was telling. Similarly, in Mark 10, he said the people brought their children to see Jesus, hoping that he might grant them this blessing, but his disciples turned them away. Wow is right. Thank you, Nate, my foot pedal. He turned them away. The disciples turned them away. They forgot what he said. This is the example of how we're supposed to be. And you can think of the innocence of a child and all, right? But, but what about the fact that their minds are like sponges? They're always wanting to learn. They don't think they've arrived. They're humble about it. If they, if they don't know how to swim, they don't know how to swim. Christians act like they do. Because <laughs> we don't want to look bad. Whatever. I'm just saying, becoming like a little child is not to be childish, it's to be childlike. That's what he's saying, be childlike in, in the way you approach the kingdom, but also be intentional about speaking to the children because you can learn something from them. Somebody's happy. Hallelujah. I thought it was one of the kids in the balcony, but when Jesus saw this, he was incensed. Wow. He never sinned, but he was incensed. He was singed, <laughs> but he didn't sin. So you can be angry and not sin. It's really hard. So be careful. It's really hard. He said, let the children come to me and don't ever stand in their way, for this is the kingdom, what the kingdom of God is all about. Truly anyone who doesn't accept the kingdom of God as a little child can never see it. So we go in with awe-filled wonder. What are you going to show me today, Lord? Well, I've read that chapter 45 times. I've taught three different classes on it. Doesn't matter. This doesn't change. You do. <laughs> okay? As you're changing, you look at the truth and you see it through a whole different lens. Man, I'll tell you, it's an amazing book. There's nothing like it. It's alive. Keep studying. Keep praying. Ask the Lord. Remove the blockage so that I can get it and understand it. Almost done with the analogy here. Firstborn son in Deuteronomy, it says he gets a double portion of all that the father has. That doesn't mean he gets everything, but if there's four kids, the first one gets twice as much as the next three in the inheritance. Why? Are they shown favoritism? No. It's that the oldest son is going to be expected to run the family after the father's gone. So there's a lot more responsibility involved in that. And those three younger siblings are not going to always like the decision. So God's saying, I'll give you a little bonus here because it's a tough job. <laughs> Anybody been in that role? Been an executor of, of an estate? Oh, man, you see some demons coming out. <laughs> so people don't always understand this, but it says that the fa it's the first fruits. That son is the first fruits of the father's strength. The right of the firstborn belongs to him. It's not all cheerful because you get twice as much. You get twice as much responsibility or more, and not everybody's up to it. If you watch the movie The King's Speech about one of the kings of England, his older brother was entitled to get it, but the older brother took, said, no, I don't want it. You can have it. And God doesn't like that. See, God wants us to step up for our responsibilities and take that obligation and not cruise See, the, those families had all been kings and queens throughout, and now the older brother's like, no, I'm going to check out. Because this is a, tr a tough one to understand, too. In Romans 9, uh, Paul refers to Rebecca, and God had told Rebecca that the older twin is going to serve the younger twin. 
that's not how it normally would be. What do you think that could mean? Those of you who are buried into your fur coats, so sorry. As it is written, Jacob I've loved, but Esau I hated. God is saying he hates somebody. What? Well, look, Esau was the one who should have been willing to take on the father's double portion. He was the older of the two. And he traded it for a bowl of porridge, whatever that is. Not a good trade. And everybody's so tough on Jacob. Well, he didn't have to say yes. So did I really steal it? Well, later you stole it because you and your mom conned your father. But in that moment that he gave away his, his, his right, then God could be saying, well, why would I want to give it to somebody who doesn't want it? Another day. So is this a blessing or a curse? I don't know if you can even see it, but it's all information pounding this person. And, you know, older people, I think, have a little bit of a harder time with all the information overload. And the younger people, because they've had it, uh, might see it this way, right, which is, you're wearing the goggles and you're looking at all of these um, virtual reality things. And, and for the older people, it's a little tougher. So bear with me here just for a minute. This is, a, this is one way that a chart shows all the different generations that go back to 1915 and to 2015. So in 100 years, what they're identifying is six generations. All right, and, you know, these names are not final, but it's just what people call them. So baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, Gen Z, that all means something. But uh, that's not my point is to unpack all that. It's to, it's to remind us that, yes, it's our obligation to pass on the truths, pass on the timeless truths to the next generation, but that it gets harder with every succeeding generation. Now, I'll try to explain what I mean. As we age we tend to like nostalgia versus I love to learn new things. <laughs> Go on your high school Facebook page if you have a page. I mean, I don't know how many hours they spend finding these old photos of Jan's ice cream store, the drive-in theater on Route 22 in Union. Like, get a life, man. You people, stop living in the past. It's exciting. Serve God. It's never a dull moment. Like, you're stuck on the past. It was great, but it's great today. Anyway, they didn't elect me president. <laughs> so I'm saying mentoring each next gen has become a, a bigger challenge. So just real quickly, in 1947, not far from here, the first transistor was invented in Mary Hill. So prior to 47, you couldn't bring your radio to the beach and listen to all your favorite songs. But the transistor radio blew up when they invented this thing. And now all of a sudden, that brought a bunch of music to people that never would have heard it before. There were radios before that, but not portable. Oh, that's good. And then the microchip, well, first of all, it was Mary Hill at Bell Labs. And Mary Hill is where that, excuse me, where that transistor was invented. There's a lot of rich history in New Jersey of inventions and new ideas. The light bulb, <laughs> pretty good. Went all around the world. Then in 1958, so 11 years later, they then come up with a microchip. 12 years later, there's a moonwalk. IBM comes out with the PC 12 years after that. And then Netscape comes out with this browser in 13 years. So it's like pretty big increments before the next breakthrough comes. And then the iPhone came out in 2007, and Google allowed you to start searching in 2008. So if I could just be real here for a minute, how hard do you think it is for this generation who grew up with an iPhone and Google search to talk to these folks who had to go to the library and pull out 15 different books by the time I got down the aisle, they already have the answer on Google, okay? It's not fair. <laughs> but we gave them all these tools. It was part of the progress. It's great that we can have all these things. They could be used for plenty of evil. But this is part of the challenge. How hard are we trying to understand how these people will process when we're from back here? I don't think we're trying hard enough. Because it's really hard. 
they have had so much information from such a young age for so long that if you'll just sit and talk to them expecting to learn something, you will learn something. You might not like everything you're learning, but you'll learn something. And if we take that posture, the younger people are going to receive a blessing because we have a lot to give them. But nobody wants to be lectured. So that's the rest of the picture. It's like, when do you go back and just sit down with somebody? Or when do you invite, if you're in the older generation, when do you invite them to come and have a cup of coffee? And I want to learn about your life. I want to learn about what's important to you. What are your friends saying? What's the generation saying? Instead of, there's kids out today, teenagers, that don't want to, like, order a pizza from the pizzeria because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing on the phone. They, they got so used to texting. Nobody should be afraid to call Vinny's Pizza. They don't care if you make a mistake. Sausage, pepperoni, whatever you want, no problem. And I'm not meaning to mock this. Something happened in the culture that created such this paranoia of making a mistake that, that we've lost one of the biggest, most important blessings of community is talking to each other. Well, that's not from God. We've got to talk to each other. We've got to communicate the power of the church is that we're together. Forsake not the assembling together with other believers. You good? I'm going to end now. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. I'm going to go right to the last one. I'll go to this one. All right, you can stand up now so you know I'm serious. <laughs> Paul said, this is my life's work, helping people understand and respond to this message. Anybody can relate? You want to help people understand and respond to this message. That's good news. It comes as a sheer gift to me, a real surprise. God handled all the details because when it came to presenting the message to people who had no background in God's way, I was the least qualified of any of the available Christians. You get what Paul's doing? He's a humble man. He's saying they never should have picked me to go to the Gentiles. I was an expert on the Jews. But I saw to it that God had a plan. God saw to it that I was equipped but you can be sure it had nothing to do with my natural abilities. That's a good place to be, humble. And so here I am, preaching and writing about things that are way over my head. The inexhaustible riches and generosity of Christ. We I'm sorry. My task is to bring out in the open and make plain what God, who created all this, has been doing in secret and behind the scenes all along. So as brilliant as Paul was, he was still trying to translate all the Hebrew knowledge he had and come to grips with a new paradigm that you can only be saved by faith, not by works. We should really be grateful for Paul because he wrestled with God to get these truths down on paper. And half the time he was just dictating it as he was going. Wow, what a, what a gift he is to us. But then he says this amazing thing, that it's through this group of people, through the church, through the local church, none of us feeling fully qualified for any of this stuff. It's through the church that this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Like, can you believe that God used him? <laughs> me, I'm talking about me now. Nothing's impossible for God, right? This was planned by God and then executed in Christ Jesus. When we trust in him, we're free to say what needs to be said and bold to go where we need to go. That's a really good way to end because that's our identity, right? That's my identity. I'm a child of God first. Before anything else, I'm a child of God. And he's got this same plan that he told Paul Get about the Father's business and let people know there's freedom in Christ. And if you'll just sit down with young people, they're confused about a lot of stuff. And you have more wisdom than you realize, but you can expect to learn something from them too. So you're not going in as the teacher pointing the fingers and, what's wrong with you? Don't you get it? What are you, stupid? Bad idea. No, I respect you. I honor you. You're the next gen. You're going to be our future. We need you to know these timeless truths. But because we haven't worked that graph very well, and we just expect them to listen to us, no, let's repent of that and say, Lord, I open up my heart. And I want to be, uh, I want to be a resource to these people, young people especially, but I also want to receive what you want to say to me through them. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to just... 
pass on these timeless truths that we could translate into the currency of the current kingdom, that into the language and, and translate it with fluency into a way that people would understand it, especially the younger people who might feel neglected or who feel so disconnected from what was normal to us is so different for them today. We ask you to download strategy to us as the adults and, and those that might have the, the advantage of the wisdom of our age and experience, but to also translate it to them in a way that they can speak into our hearts and into our lives so this timeless truth gets transferred into this time-bound world that we're living in. Could you say it with me? Use me to, to advance your kingdom to every next generation that has come up behind me in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.